Good, uh, good day. My name is Rob Straw. I'm the CEO of SEEP's uh, Zurich campus, and I welcome you heartily to our final webinar series in this uh, webinar series. Uh, it's, it's, as I said, it's the final webinar in our Future of Work series. We've been working on this for quite some time. Over the last uh, several months, we've been exploring key topics relating to the future of work, such as diversity, culture, talent management, leadership, obviously, strategic business models, how they've changed, and, and other topics, including how technology and more, even more frequently, how the COVID has affected the future uh, landscape of work. The webinar series might be coming to an end uh, and the year is coming to an end, but the, for the future of work, SEEPS is just beginning. Um, we are working on an exclusive future of work academic program to be run out of the Zurich campus. It will be brought to you by uh, Zurich campus as well as some of the partners that have been with us for the, for the journey of the, of the webinars. And we'll keep you updated uh, on the progress uh, over the next couple of months. If you're interested in the program or would like to be involved as a contributor or as a participant, please get in touch with Hannah or myself. Today's final series is brought to you in collaboration, as always, with a partner or partners. Not only SEEPS, SEEPS, we partner deeply across uh, many organizations uh, to, to, because it's about the, the doing it, we might be doing the research on it, but organizations like Mercer and Alibaba are our partners today, and we're going to be exploring the topic of managing human capital and the new employee experience, managing human capital and the new employee experience. We welcome you to answer, to ask questions anytime. There's a Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. If you just type in your questions, uh, we're gonna do the format a little bit differently today. We're going to have two speakers as usual, and then we're going to inv invite a, um, another person to join the panel. Um, and we really ask you to raise your hand or, uh, or, or ask the Q&A. We want this to be a lively session. To get us warmed up, we like to start with a poll. I'd like to ask you a, a the first polling question, if I may. So on a scale of one to 10, how high is your webinar and online fatigue? We've been doing this, some of us, for nine months. Okay. Some of you are, some of you are not fatigued at all, and some are absolutely fatigued. I guess it depends on the day, the time of the day, even the, the, the time in the week what the offering is. I don't know if it's if I'm any different than you, but I spend between four and six hours most days online. I'm working in the office or at my home or in my vacation home in the mountains. Um, and some days it, it's quite tiring. So we see, you know, 20% of you have said no fatigue at all. Fantastic. That means you, you, this is, it's, it's working. It's really working. And um, another 20% of you also said seven. That means quite fatigued, okay? Now I'd like to ask you a, uh, another question on, this, on the second part of the poll. As home office is becoming more and more the norm, is employee experience more or less important to your firm than say last year? Okay, thank you. So 50% of you say more, 17 say less and 33 say about the same. So it's great. I think I think this mimics my organization, and I know uh, in talking with uh, one of the speakers with uh, Joost from from Mercer, I feel like their organization also has has put a lot more effort into this because you're not you're not in the office. So this is some of the things that some of the things that we want to be talking about, and it n nicely moves moves us into the next point. If you would like to delve further into how the um, the pandemic has impacted your professional working experience, we would invite you to participate in a survey that's being conducted by a leading human research, uh, uh, human resource research firm and one of our partners, uh, the I4CP. The survey that they've launched, and I actually just took it this morning, it looks at leadership actions and, and organizational actions that become more or less important during the pandemic. They also, and also supports a company's ability to pivot and thrive over the last nine months. So those who, were, who take part in the survey obviously will receive a copy of this if you provide them with your emails. 
Um, we will send you the link in our follow-up. We always send a follow-up email to everyone who's registered with us um, to participate in this. I found the, uh, I found the questions quite uh, meaningful. Without further ado, I'd like to in introduce our two speakers. As usual, we have a, a SEEPS professor who takes the lead, and then we couple that, and they usually give uh, research insights from their work and their research and their consulting work, and then we couple that with one or two uh, in e industry experts. Today, we have Michelle Tsing. Michelle is Associate Professor of Management at SEEPS. She has a PhD in Organizational Behavior. She specializes in the area of leadership, conflict management, negotiations, and decision-making. Joost Hultmann, Joost is principal consultant at Mercer. I know uh, Joost as, a, as a, a service provider working for a former organization. Uh, we worked with them who, on, on the client experience and employee experience survey for the entire organization. Mercer really focuses a, a lot of work on this uh, uh, aspect of, of work and the future of work. His particular focus is on advising organizations on the design and the organization of human capital research, the analytics of HR data, as I mentioned with the employee, employee experience, and the design of practical interventions of how to improve this. Michelle, I'm very pleased to hand the floor over to you. Thank you, Michelle. Yeah, thank you. So, I'm about to give a talk about how to navigate in this crisis. So uh, my name is uh, Michelle Zhen, as introduced by Robert already. So I'm a faculty member from China Europe International Business School. Today, I'm going to talk about meeting the challenges of the COVID-19 workplace. So now you will understand why I call it meeting the challenges. So there are a lot of problems we are currently facing and in the future we're likely to face. And I'm going to offer you solutions represented by this MEET framework. So includes mindfulness, empathy, equality, and trust. But before I proceed, I also would like to ask you a poll. Okay, Hannah, maybe you can help me to post the poll. During the last month, how often have you or your employees actually felt nervous and stressed. Actually, the result shows that 66% often felt stressful or your employees actually complain to you, I'm overwhelmed, right? Actually, this is consistent with a recent survey conducted in the US among Americans. So it shows that nearly eight out of 10 people said that COVID-19 is their major stressor. And seven out of 10 actually indicated that they experienced increased stress over the last period during the pandemic. So before we move to like a long-term managing human capital, I think we have a more pressing issue here is that our employees are suffering from the psychological well-being. They experience decreased psychological well-being. What should we do about it? So I'm going to offer you the first solution, which is based on my recent research conducted in Wuhan and the UK. So the first solution is mindfulness. I'm sure that a lot of you heard about mindfulness or even practiced it before. It's a very simple breathing exercise and often conducted offline, face to face. And my experiment actually shows that what I did I have a group of Wuhan residents, workers. During the serious breakout in February in Wuhan, they seriously are locked down in the, in their, at a, their home. And I have 50 workers. They actually practice mindfulness every day for 10 minutes only, very short. And then they do it for continuously 10 days, two weeks. And another group of people, they did not practice it. So the results actually is very dramatic. It shows that people who practice mindfulness, they slept better. Even though, as you see the solid line here, uh, as the cases increase, people who did not practice mindfulness, they slept worse. But the people who practice mindfulness, the line is flat. They almost are buffered from this negative impact, the stressor, right? 
And then we conducted a study in UK in June, which is also quite a bad period of time at that time. And we found the same results, is that mindfulness states actually can buffer the negative impact of COVID-19 stressors on UK workers' sleep, and that they even become more engaged at work. Okay, so this paper is uh, forthcoming with Frontiers in Psychology. This offer evidence-based intervention for organizations they can readily take. It's just 10 minutes and it's cheap, easy. You can implement online very easily, okay? And then the next solution, how to improve your employees' psychological well-being is to show empathy. As this famous saying said, people will forget what you said and that they will forget what you did, but they will never forget how you made them feel. Again, this is backed by a very recent research published in 2020, recently with a top tier journal. So it's a very interesting finding actually. So they collected data among, uh, between February to May, 2020 uh, in un United States, different states. And what they found is that states with women governors had fewer COVID-19 deaths compared to states with men governors. It's quite a striking finding. So as you see that in this pink bar, even though both male and female governors, they implement same kind of policy. In this case, it's a, a parts of the states needs to stay at home. Still, women governors did better during the crisis. And then for states that actually issue, you have to stay at home, all of them. Still, women governors did better during the crisis. Then you wonder what happened? How can we explain the results? So they coded 251 briefings containing millions of words. And what they found is that women governors tend to express more empathy and confidence during their briefings. And this explained results. Now we know that to address this immediate uh, problems in the workplace to improve your employees' experience, we have empathy and mindfulness. And actually, in the long term, COVID-19 has strengthened or heightened a trend that we cannot avoid, which is more and more people are going to work from home. In fact, this figure shows that um, China market, remote, uh, remote working market actually increased dramatically compared uh, 2018 with 2020. And 53.8% people actually extended their working hours at home. So this is a trend you cannot avoid. And this poses a very serious problem, actually. Some people may not see it, which is the gender inequality. A uh, Harvard Business Review article said that it may set back gender equality. In fact, a recent survey shows that women's jobs are almost two times more vulnerable to the men during this crisis. And on top of that, they suffer a psychological burden. They end up doing housework at the same time work from home. What is the solution? Actually, I want to show this article, it's connected to me as a female scholar. So this article come out in the middle of uh, this year. An editor find out raised this issue. Women academics seem to submit fewer papers during COVID-19. This is just the illustration of how serious the problem can be if you don't take care of this issue. And the solutions, okay, a recent research shows a very simple solution for people who need to manage work-life balance is that wife does one day housework and next day husband does the work. It shows that it can keep your job performance adequate. And for managers, you need to be able to track the data, be alert. You need to check if your company losses of jobs are mainly from women and a wider promotion for women are slowing down. And make sure you hire gender balance way. 
and you take actions to address it and increase gender equality throughout your ecosystem, not only within your company, but also your supply chain, your client's company. So I would like to ask you the next question. When your employees who work from home do not reply to your email in a timely fashion, to what extent you are wondering whether they're slacking off? What, I wonder whether they're watching some shows or they're busy with their family matters. Now we can see that the results are actually more than only 30% of people indicated, I'm not wondering at all. I don't, I trust them fully. And most of the people are actually like around almost 70% thinks that they may be slacking, wondering, right? So this again is consistent with a recent research. So a recent survey shows that 40% of supervisors they surveyed believe that remote workers perform worse when they're at home. So this is consistent with your worry, right? So this work from home pose another problem, which is lack of trust when working remotely. How do we address it? Solution, for companies who already have high level of trust, good for you because this is the time you can benefit most during the crisis. For companies do not have so much trust yet, do not make it worse. Do not make your employees feel monitored or distrusted. And you can train managers in how to devolve job autonomy. So job autonomy is not abandon your employees. And it's also not to micromanaging them. You need to check in, provide guidelines, information, but do not check up on, monitor them. And you also need to train managers in how to manage by results, okay? Instead of looking at when, how, you look at outcomes. An extreme case is like results only work environment. And this is done very effectively by a company named Best Buy. Okay, so today my talk actually offered you this MEET framework. And when we think of resilience, actually we always think of it as bouncing back, the ability to bounce back, right? But for people who are really experiencing adversity, actually they don't have that bouncing back luxury. Actually scholars define resilience as the ability to navigate through crisis and move forward more equipped. And I hope this MEET framework can help you better equipped navigating the current crisis and moving forward. Thank you. Michelle, thank you very much. Um, I especially love to, to hear your research and the research on equality. Um, we're in 2020, it's shocking. It's absolutely shocking, uh, these, these numbers still. You know, when, when people are talking, you know, we're, what, what's the issue with, with diversity and equality? We still have issues with diversity and equality. We still have issues with trust and control. Um, Joost, I'm going to hand the floor right to you and we're going to come back to some of these topics around meat and resilience after Joost is finished. Joost, the floor is yours. Thanks, Rob, and uh, thanks, Michelle. And hi, everybody. Thanks for taking the time to attending this webinar. Um, as Rob introduced me initially, uh, I work for Mercer as a consultant. Uh, I specialize in employee research. And if I went to, we do surveys, uh, pulse surveys, census surveys, we do focus group interviews. So if I had to summarize what we do in, in one sentence, I think it's that we bring the employee voice to the decision-making process uh, for large organizations. Now, that's important for many re uh, reasons. Uh, of course, you want your organizational health to be right there, knowing what people see, where your strengths, weaknesses are, etc. But when you talk about shaping the employee experience for the future, of course, uh, understanding what employees want, what they need, how they think, uh, feel about your work, et cetera, is very important. Now, we have researchers and been going talking about the employee experience for a while. And what we found is that we've moved from what we've called the loyalty contract, where work was defined, the relationship with your employer, mostly about 
pay, benefits, uh, job security, etc. To today, where we call it an engagement contract, where we have got all the sun more, much more experience as part of the, the deal. You also have some achievement, uh, growth opportunities, work-life balance is important, etc. And what we envisioned for the future was more um, a contract uh, one step further, where an experience where you also have purpose uh, for work, meaningful work, and those type of things where you can really thrive in your everyday job. That's where we envisioned uh, the future of work would be the future of the employee experience. And then, of course, COVID-19 struck, as uh, Michelle already mentioned, and as I'm sure you've all experienced. So all of a sudden, I'm in Europe, uh, so a little later than in, in China, but um, in, in March, all of a sudden, everything was locked down. We're in a crisis, and as the quote says here that I quite liked and that I've seen, uh, applied also the last six months is, never let a good crisis go to waste. <clears throat> so that's where we're at today. We work for hundreds of organizations, and I would like, rather than, the 10 minutes will not be sufficient to really give a full vision about how we see the employee experience in the future, how we see the path towards that and how we see it uh, changing over the, because of the COVID-19 pandemic. But there are two lessons that I've seen from two case studies that I'd like to share. So with that having said that, <clears throat> I think just a quick recap. March uh, in Europe, uh, pandemic strikes earlier in China, USA a little later, perhaps it became really evident, but there you go. What we have seen when we talk to all our clients, employees working for many organizations all over the globe, is that there was a response phase where all of a sudden processes are disrupted, employees are at home, and that went quite well. Most employees are really content with how it's managed. Many people have been able to keep their um, meeting their responsibilities. And in a matter of weeks, this was all re redone. Now, we at Mercer, we see, we saw the response phase, then we anticipated the return phase, which we're right in the middle of, and then the reinvent phase. The return phase more complex. There's less urgency. Uh, it's, it's not an acute problem anymore, but all of a sudden we're starting to think, how do we all go back to work? What will it look like? Some people will still want to work from home. Others can't wait to go back to the office. Certain people in factories, they have to do their work right then and there. But how do you do that at a meter and a half distance or two meters or however long it is in the local um, uh, context? So that was more complex, but still uh, going quite well. And now the next phase is that reinvent phase. How will we shape work in the future? How will we shape the way we work? And how will we shape the employee experience? And this will be even more complex, of course. So let's not forget a couple of lessons learned while reinventing the employee experience. And for that, let me show you, and I'm going to put this out of screen. Um, let me show you a case study. It's a financial services provider. <clears throat> we have surveyed their employee experience uh, using engagement surveys, as you can see in 2018, 2019. 2018, uh, they saw that people, there were quite a bit of things they liked about the company, but they complained about not having the right tools and resources. They weren't happy with efficiency of processes, communication uh, effectively, <clears throat> over 60% put people would be favorable about that. And the perception of senior leaders and the way they act is that consists of what they say. You can see the scores in 2018. Uh, you can see also how things have changed over time. A slight decrease here, a slight increase there. And that's where they're at. Uh, 2019, they're making new plans. And I'm going to take a quick break here just to see if any of you has an idea what this company, knowing this, now should do to really improve those, the, the perception of employees about the tools and resources they have, <clears throat> about the senior leaders, etc. If you want to speak up, please do uh, use your hand raising icon and Hannah can then unmute you. Or we can take a minute uh, to see if some uh, response will come into chat. Uh, and, and again, maybe Hannah, you can uh, then help me out with uh, seeing what comes in uh, and what we read out there. Anybody, a thought, what could this company do to prevent this scores from stagnating into 2020? Well, <clears throat> let me share something else then um, here. Yeah. And that is this. We surveyed them again in 2020. And you can see how employee perception has went upward. 
uh, tremendous amounts. All of a sudden, uh, people were much more inclined to stay, much happier about processes, much happier about communication, and much more positive about senior leaders. So what happened in between? Of course, COVID-19 happened in between. I'm going to give you some more details about them in a second, but let's take a look at the second case study. It's a manufacturing global uh, about senior management perception uh, about the company. How do they communicate? Um, again, you see the scores 2016, 2019, slightly decline, even if anything, and they weren't too high to begin with. So they really wanted to change that. And again, we surveyed them in 2020 and we see a massive shift. And let's not make a mistake. These companies both did a tremendous amount of work between the two surveys to try to improve scores. But the COVID-19 pandemic, something changed and all of a sudden they were, their employees were a lot more positive about working here. So what did they do? Two lessons that I'd like to share uh, here today. Both companies had been reluctant to let people work from home, even though people uh, asked for it. They, they didn't quite trust it. They weren't certain would people still work? Uh, how would teamwork go, et cetera, et cetera. So it had been dragging their feet a little bit for, for a few years. And then all of a sudden they had to send people home. All of a sudden it was not just allowed, it was fully supported. There was new technology implemented to make it happen. There was new um, uh, online meeting technology. So a couple of things were dealt on with very quickly by the sense of urgency, namely, now we trust people, we have to trust them to work from home, and we're going to enable it as well as we can. Second thing both these companies did was, instead of communicating as they had always done, especially senior management, that every other month maybe you give an update on the company figures, on some strategy plans, maybe a merge and acquisition that you're thinking of, all of a the sudden they started to communicate much more frequently mm -hmm. and with empathy. How are people doing? We're all worried as managers. How are people doing at home? How is the team functioning? In fact, I can relate to you because I myself am stuck at home um, and I'm feeling the same anxious, uh, same level of anxiousness, same level of anticipation for the future. So we saw a lot more communication with empathy. We saw management really listening. They did digital focus groups with people. They did interviews, they did pulse surveys. They engaged in online meetings and they were really curious to see what's going on because we all know, need to know how are people doing at home? Are they do, what's working well? What's working not so well? Where do we need to change? Where do we really need to help out with some emotional assistance? So regardless of where uh, that employee experience will develop into, I think these two lessons uh, were great to see that trust in people uh, allowed flexibility in, in the way they work, because this is not going back to the way it was before where everybody's back in the workshop and in the, uh, the office for 40 hours a week. This will be much more hybrid, I expect. Mm -hmm. And keep that communication. You see it work well. We saw it in the scores for these two companies. They start communicating with more empathy and the perception of senior management uh, and of the company all of a sudden is much more positive. That is not something you only can do in times of a pandemic. That is something we can try to keep up uh, from here on. So that um, was uh, the conclusions I saw from these two case studies there. And I think I can also share just from my own uh, personal experience. I work uh, for Mercer. We had the same challenges. Uh, all of a sudden we all work from home. And also I recall just how interesting it is and how much more we all of a sudden see of especially senior management, how much we get updated about how the company's doing, uh, the plans we make for the future, how do we think to deal with the challenges that they come up with. Uh, we are asked to give input for the, how will we come back to work from in, in the near future when we can do so again? What will that look like? Who feels safe, who doesn't feel safe? And I thought that was a really good way and a very engaging way. And I felt much a stronger bond with that employer, in my case, Mercer. So that's what I wanted to share with you. Uh, just two quick lessons that I hope we don't forget. Trust in people, flexible work is great. Uh, it works for many people, also for companies and communicate often and with empathy. Joost, you make it sound so easy. Well, it only takes a major crisis to make it happen, Rob. Yeah, in that, that's in that, in that the thing. 
Uh, yeah, so let's, um, Michelle, I'd invite you to come back with your uh, mic and your camera on. I would like to invite Shin Fan also to join us as a panelist. Shin is, um, she's the head of Europe, she's European Regional HR for Alibaba. Uh, she's responsible for HR for France, Italy, Belgium, and Luxembourg. Uh, Shin, do you want to join us also uh, turning on your, your video and your audio? And uh, we can start some uh, some questions. Hi, Shin. Nice, nice to have you with us. So Hello, one thing everyone. is, one thing is, you know, I'm going to start with where uh, yours you left off. Um, you know, we see this line 2016, 2019, and then this huge spike. This is the envy of every firm, and yet a lot of firms went the other way. They didn't make it. They didn't make it because the leadership couldn't do it for whatever reason. So in that short period of time, you either made it or you didn't, it seems like. There wasn't a lot of in-betweens. So uh, some thoughts I had were forced trust. I'm forced to trust now. In a, in a Chinese context, we don't like this. Tr you know, we, we like to control. Is that really true? Do we, you know, what about forced trust? Um, when you say, you know, communication with empathy and truly listening, I work a lot with global leaders. And to, to, to wait, I wish I had a magic wand that could improve the listening skills of, the, of many global leaders. They either are great listeners or they're not great listeners. To learn that in 12 months, it's a character thing, right? So what, maybe we can talk about this for just a minute on forced trust, how do you, when the senior leadership, because a lot of people on the call are also senior leaders, how, how do you gain empathy through this crisis? How do you become a better listener through this crisis? Any thoughts, Shin, in your work with your executives? Okay. I just realized it's a question for me. <laughs> okay, great. Thanks, thanks for for giving some introduction. I think force to trust. I personally don't think trust is things that we can force. Um, it, it's a, it's like a difference of um, leadership and charisma. Uh, mm -hmm. Charisma is something something trust is something very internal. Um, we can only uh, give to someone else when we are willing to. So personally, I don't think trust could, could be forced, first of all. And, but which is very true that <clears throat> for a Chinese company, um, give more authori authorizations to employees is, is there something that is slightly different compared to Western, like Europe or US companies. I think the, the mind of thinking is quite different due to the historical, our history and the philosophies, et cetera. We more trust authorizations uh, thanks to the Confucius, Confucius uh, thinking, whatever. Sometimes it might have some um, obeisance, how to say, oh, obey, obeying something. It might be in the culture. However, um, I think in a modern and globalization context, all the Chinese company, not only for not only Alibaba or, or Huawei or any other great companies like Tencent, etc or TikTok, whatever. I think all the Chinese companies who has ambition to go global, they are trying to adapt their company culture or Chinese employees mindset in a global context and inevitable trust, especially trust during the COVID uh, home office period is a very important subject for, uh, for employees from leadership level and to the ground level. Mm. So I could give an example that how we learn from doing um, I'm not giving this um, in presenting Alibaba, but I'm trusting a lot of Chinese company has the similar examples nowadays. Um, for example, like uh, we have everybody are doing home office nowadays, all the European Europe based employees are working from home now. Mm -hmm. And one day <clears throat> there's a um, employee calling me that I'm so disappointed. She's based in UK. She said, I'm, I was so, I'm so disappointed because my manager who's based in China uh, he dropped me a call. I was so glad to pick it up. But at the end, he, he jumped into the KPI, jumped into the, the project project review immediately instead of not asking me a quick question. How are you? How did you spend your weekend? Are you fine? Etc. I think it could be a culture stuff. 
and I check with the Chinese manager, why don't you, you know, just ask very, um, you know, a simple greetings before talking KPIs. He mm -hmm. said, I was so afraid because I heard that European people are very conscious about privacy, yeah. about their personal life. So it's not that people are not having the willingness um, to, 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 you know, to trust each other, but there's a, there's a difference in the mentality. They are afraid of not doing the right things. I think right. there's no right and wrong, but sure. by communicating this type of things, we can get to know each other, each, each other better. So right. we cannot judge a fact, but we have to know the intentions be, behind, these, uh, behind, behind these facts in order to you know, go more global and understand one another better and better. Hmm. Yeah, I think that's a very small example of, uh, of trust building between a Chinese manager and a Western employee. And by, you know, and communication, communicate in others, uh, in a way that other people prefers, I think the globalization in the COVID or home office period, it could be, it could work better and more trust would be spontaneously giving. Thanks. Um, Michelle, I'm going to turn to you, you know, from a research perspective, how can leaders build trust? Yeah, I was going to uh, respond to what Xing just mentioned, spontaneous trust. Actually, the research shows that during crisis or like uh, like an urgent task nature, mm. people are able to build swift trust. That's what we call swift tr trust. Mm. You can often see that actually um, in the surgery room, like doctors and nurses, they can't even see each other properly, but they can function perfectly. Mm -hmm. So that's what we call sweet tr uh, trust. Mm -hmm. And you said that uh, companies actually either make it or not. This is a test for sweet trust. I think it's like, if company cannot build this trust immediately, spontaneously, they fail because that's the use utility of trust, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? So yeah. this is a, what research has found, spontaneous, uh, spontaneous trust and a swift trust. Right. And in terms of how leaders can build trust, right? Um, actually, we have a formula. So for trust, it's composed of three elements, which is uh, integrity, benevolence, and competence. But in the virtual setting, what you can see clearly is only the competence. And mm -hmm. also, whether you are willing to trust so that's what we call the dispositional trust, like the person, your followers, whether they're willing to give you the benefit of doubt. So what leaders can do actually um, to compensate for that is to try to show consist uh, consistency when they communicate and the transparency and the kindness. Consistency. So let me jump to that and come to Yoast because Yoast, you showed a firm that had a, you know, fairly flat lines between a couple of the engagement surveys and then a huge spike. Again, uh, you know some people I'm thinking about, it's kind of hard for these managers and these leaders just to switch and to be dispositionally trusting or trustworthy overnight. It, it, it's in a character thing. So what happened here? How can this consistency change so that communication is better, uh, my empathy grows, I become more trusting to this in such a short time due to this shock in the system. What, what are your, what are your, what, what have you witnessed in the last nine, nine months here? Well, what I've witnessed in, in many companies, and as you said, uh, Rob, not all of them had the same results. I've also definitely foreseen for other clients that didn't have such a huge jump. Yeah. So it's not just because there's external factors. These companies mm -hmm. really did something different. As Shin said, you can't force trust on that. I think that's correct. But I also think that this was a case where the company, both companies knew uh, about flexible working. This is the way we have to go. But they don't really dare because the business is going well, why risk it? And all of a sudden they were put to context change and now they're, they weren't forced to trust. Well, they were forced to sort of adapt to that. Uh, and I think that tipped the balance into, okay, let's go for it because we've got nothing to lose. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I think that really uh, changed it for these companies. They dared go for the flexible working. Uh, and the second thing, the empathy, that's the tricky one, of course. Uh, and I think this probably comes to your field, Rob, of leadership development as well. And I'm sure uh, Michelle and Chin know a lot more about that. But what I did see, and this is because I've spoken to many companies and managers about senior management, how did you guys react? What do you see? Mm -hmm. And the common denominator here is that these two management teams managed to change their communication style. 
again, pushed by the pandemic, pushed by a certain need, but they managed to do so. And I think that's where their success uh, in, in upgrading that employee experience in the short term, at least, uh, comes from. Again, to reiterate, more regular, deeper, more op more transparent communication, right? That's I think we're... perhaps um, more vulnerable, if you will, showing with empathy. I think what these managers managed to do is to go away from that management role and be a human. So uh, in, in all of the calls that we've had in the last, you know, uh, uh, Hannah is in the background here. We've done 25 of these different webinars in the last nine months. And this hum humanness comes out in almost every single one. We Somehow it's not just, um, you know, Michelle, when we were having a pre-talk, we talked, you know, you're at home, your son's running around type of thing. You know, the dog is running across the in the background, the cat on the desk. Um, we all laugh about these things, but before I didn't have to bring that into work. And now I can't not bring it to work if I'm working from home, you know? We become, because, you know, maybe I'm sitting here in my pajama bottoms. I'm not, but I could be. Um, we become more human somehow. And, and that only makes it better for trust and empathy and all of these things to increase the employee engagement, uh, client engagement, uh, right? But specifically, Shin, maybe you can address this one. I'll come back to you first. How can we as leaders, as managers, how can we develop empathy? Very good question, Robert. <clears throat> I think the, the COVID pushed everybody to develop empathy. Without that, I saw the situation that the relationship between employee and employer uh, broke and which created a, a huge um, difficulties and challenges for the business continuity. So I think the situation really pushed every, every leaders or managers to, to, um, to, to build empathy. For me, I think the most important thing is to really put your shoes, uh, put your feet into other people's shoes. Exchange, in Chinese we say huan wei si kao, exchange your positions to see the things from other people's position or chairs, whatever. So I think this is really a practice that we have to, uh, we have to force our, this, this, this thing, I, I could say that we could force people to do that. Mm -hmm. I think we have to do this practice, not only in the professional life, but also in our personal life um, and, and, and every relationship that, <clears throat> that require uh, EQ, sorry, mm -hmm. emotion and intelligence, we need to, we need to, we need to show the empathy. They're really, mm -hmm. the, this really is the thing that smooths all the relationship by having a smoother relationship in a very isolated situation, we will become happier and the world will be more har har harmony and, and the work as well. It's really exchange our position to thinking other people's shoes. I think it also hits a lot of us uh, uh, closer to home when we're hearing about people being in quarantine uh, with their, with, you know, locked in in a lockdown situation or in worst case, someone has, has had COVID in a family or themselves or a death. We've experienced, many of us have experienced death that's close to us in the for the first time in our lives. Death may have been a remote topic and now here it is. Uh, a family member from a, an employee has passed or a parent or even an employee or someone close. And this has really been an eye opener for, for many people to slow down and breathe for a minute. This is, these are my people. And it's sort of a, mm -hmm. I don't want to say forced empathy here, but it's kind of goes with the, how can you not become empathetic and compassionate when you see the number of people needing psychological care, uh, burnout, um, and so forth. Um, it's, it's happening all around us. Just, just on Sunday, mm -hmm. I received a call at, at eight o'clock at night. On Monday, I was supposed to go to a board meeting on an external board. And, uh, and I received a call, two of the people out of the six had been tested for COVID. Uh, so we don't have the meeting, clearly. We don't have the meeting the next day because two out of six can't be there. And your hearts automatically go out to the people thinking, I hope it's only the tested positive and that they don't really have the symptoms that are going to get sick from this. So, and I think I'm, I'm one of millions of people who have, you know, you, we just get touched by it more. Rob, um, if I add a quick something yeah. to the empathy, it's 
you can show not as a leader, of course, there's one way of showing it. But what we learned from doing focus groups for one of these clients is that one thing that many people saw as a token of empathy was the fact that the company had sent packages of safety material home. Mm. Simple as that. Mm. Uh, I received uh, flower tulip bulbs from my employer mm. because it was springtime to grow something new. But those focus groups, and there's hundreds of people participating in them, and that's where we saw simple as something, just sending a care package with a quick note uh, will go a long way. One of my team um, went home for a weekend before the lockdown and came back, and her mother had made all of us masks, handmade. You know, just it was just a, a beautiful token uh, and gesture, um, you know, very real, right? Michelle, I'm going to come back to you about some of the things that you were talking about earlier uh, on meat. And one of the things that you were specific on mindfulness, empathy, equality, and trust. Let's go to equality for a minute. And some of these things of talking about the role of women and, and COVID, where you've really shown the research where women have suffered more in many, in many cases. However, they showed this th through the governor's study, more empathy and more confidence at the same time. Yeah, yeah. yeah right. So tell us a little bit more about this. And, and again, and my comment was, we're in 2020. What, what's the deal? Are, are, fe are females the only people in traditional households that can use a vacuum cleaner or what? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> yeah, I think this can be a broader sense as well. Like yeah. we have to be aware that not everybody experienced COVID-19 the same way. Mm. We need to take into consideration the diversity, including older people, gender difference, races, all these differences when we consider the COVID-19 workplace experience. But I, because I'm a woman, so I personally have the experience during the, uh, the early March, February, when we all stay at home, mm -hmm. my male uh, friends who are academics, they're excited to tell me that, oh, you must get a lot of work done. You, probably, uh, you can send a lot of papers out. This is a good time to write, to do research. I was like, I've been like busy during the daytime and I stay up at 3 a.m. writing the papers. So we completely have different experiences. And I realize people don't, don't have that awareness. Yeah. And when I see this article about how academics suffered from this, it's a very good illustration example. So, <laughs> but yeah, at the same time, I think uh, female leaders, they can show more empathy. They can be very helpful during the crisis time, actually. Great. Um, I'd like to turn this look down to the Q&A for a second. We've got uh, uh, Aritola asking a question. It would appear that people are becoming softer and so more emotionally dependent, question mark. Yet there are still hard decisions to make for work. If I ask how you are and start to cry, telling you a real story, the remaining conversation about work might be stalled, right? Because, yeah. Uh, how do you balance? Trust is delicate and, be, and can be easily lost and hard to gain. It would appear as a privilege for successful companies, but what about those that are struggling and do not have the staying reserve and stickiness? Great comments and question. So what about those, the weaker companies that don't have the, the staying reserve and the stickiness in the situation? Any thoughts on this? A lot of thoughts there in one comment, uh, Rob. Yeah, yeah. Which one should we pick? Just pick one. It's it's okay. We're gonna just take a stab at some of this. We may, may well, maybe we don't get to all of it. Well, I think the key is to one of them. Um, I'm not sure if people have grown softer or not. I don't think I can comment on that. Uh, I can only comment on what we see is that people, when we ask them, what is it that you value in an employer? There are different things. There's pay, uh, but there's also, of course, mission, uh, a bond with the company. And for some people, uh, work-life balance is really important. If some of those needs are met very poorly, so the problem is if, if I am in a conversation as the, this person describes, and I'm sorry, I forgot the name uh, from you mentioning it, and the other person starts crying all of a sudden, then what I think is there must be something serious going on because people don't just start crying like that. Uh, we all like to keep up our demeanor. Yeah. Now, do I want to lose that employee? Probably not. Probably it's worth investing an hour and just showing 
we care and then we can go back to work again or maybe not even an hour maybe 10 minutes is sufficient so i wouldn't be too afraid of agreeing or be empathizing with someone's plight and then still be able to be discussing work i mean we still work needs to be done we just want to offer such an experience such an employee experience that motivates our people attracts people uh, retains people etc okay. what do you think rob does that go yeah. some way in answering the question yeah and you know one of the things that I personally I, I was reflecting about this as you were speaking and if that's a situation for me i, I can usually balance it where we say let's take 10 minutes if you need that afterwards come back or here's a tissue give 30 seconds pause the person pulls themselves together usually and then you're back in there and say okay let's now can we come back to whatever the point was that we actually we were trying to meet about about work um it's a little thing but uh, it's hard it's very hard it takes it takes a lot of experience doing it and of course, it's uncomfortable for us. If a, if a colleague or a superior or one of our staff is crying or very emotional and we're not used to being in an emotional work environment, that's, that's very new for us. And we, we have a, an opportunity to grow with it as well. Um, there's another question. What is your experience so far in terms of the new additional EQ that leaders need to show having direct positive measurable impact on businesses? So what part of EQ do you need to have a measurable, a, po a direct, positive, measurable impact on business? So, yeah, I can answer this question. Please. It reminds me of a recent uh, article I read from uh, California Management Review, 2019. So there's an article shows that in the future, because we're also facing the AI, right? So we're talking about what kind of job or tasks that are not going to be replaced. Mm -hmm. And that's what called feeling economy. So that kind of tasks that require us to build trust, empathy, resolve conflict, people skills, basically, mm -hmm. they are going to have the highest impact on the economy and they're not replaceable. So if you ask any specific, I think they're all very important. Anything dealing with people that will impact your business hugely in the future. The, the, the latest uh, WEF uh, research on the future of work also gives a list of these. And uh, Hannah, I'll make sure I include this list and possibly Michelle, if you could send me a link to that uh, California Management Review article, I, I would include that and send that out to everyone who's on the call as well as a, as a reference point, that's great. Um, yeah, you can automate mechanical, you know, uh, say, let's say audit things or um, many, many things, but when it comes to people, you can't really replace the people side, right? It's pretty tough. Yeah. Yeah. Jin, what are your thoughts so far? Yeah, I totally agree with what Michelle <clears throat> and you has, has, have already mentioned. I think it, it's something called love quotient, um, ARQ, love quotient. Love is not just a love in, in a very close relationship, but also a more generalized love in the professional settings and globalization settings. It's like a marriage or a couple and uh, the, the, the guy and the lady are very different, but they have to find a difference and resolve all the conflict and the difference mm -hmm. occurred in the daily life. I think the love quotient is, is so important. It's, it's about aware, observe and aware the, di aware the difference uh, in other people's parts. Second, find the consensus, which is good for both parts. I think um, the, the, the empathy is part of the love could resolve, I think, 80% of the principal and tough challenges. Mm. Thank you. I, I uh, am coaching someone right now, a very senior person. And one of the things that we're doing, because he, he has a hard time knowing himself and his team, one of the things that we did was we, we are using a, a something called a book called Love Languages. It has nothing to do with management. It has to do with mm. relationships. Mm. But in there, there's mm. a short assessment about what are your languages of love. Yeah. And that's kind of yeah. what you, how you expect to be dealing with. And so we're actually going through now with him and his direct reports and talking about their love. There's a, a question. There's a comment from Li Wang I'd like to comment on. Her, she says... Um, Empathy does not mean softness. 
showing empathy as a way to let people know that we care about people. Agreed? Yeah, that's a good point. I think that's great, right? Um, there's another question coming in. Let me just go back in there. Good. Into the chat. Let me just see what else is coming in. Uh, a question to, from Valentina. Question to Shin. Did you experience any challenges in communication between Chinese and European teams? Chinese teams were back to office in spring, but European counterparts are still at home office. Any tensions related to that and how did you overcome it? Yeah. Uh, thanks for the question, Valentina. Um, tension, no, um, but it, re it really varies from one team to another. Um, some leaders, they are more aware of the situation in Europe. They are paying very close attention to the daily increase of COVID cases in specific countries, but some are not. They're only focusing on more you know, professional parts. So it varies from one part, just no tensions. But for the later, the second part of the leaders, we will remind them that they have to pay attention Pay more attention to the team based in Europe, not to create this type of, um, how to say, people might feel uh, headquarters, uh, the, the leaders based in headquarters could be indifferent if we are not proactively, you know, greeting them, asking them what's up, whatever. So this part, we, we are doing our role as regional HR to remind headquarters to, you know, purposely or pro proactively doing this type of communication uh, to Europe and US region, because these are two most impacted regions. Mm -hmm. I, I can speak from my side too. You know, we're, we're working very closely. Uh, my, my office is in Zurich and um, we're constantly online. I spend half my day online with Shanghai and, uh, and there, you know, there are cultural differences, communication, language differences, uh, expectation differences, uh, work, habit differences um, and we, I feel like also the willingness and the desire to embrace uh, and to become one is higher now we, we want to we really want to work together and that means sometimes swallowing hard you know when, when in the past it may have been a potential conflict now we swallow and say our goal is the same actually the purpose because it comes down to purpose our purpose is the same thing. We might have different ways we get there, different work ethics, different work times, et cetera, but the goal is the same. And that helps a lot with the communication and, and the understanding and acceptance and the empathy towards each other. Yeah. Dear panelists, Shin, Michelle, and yours, thank you very much for your inputs. Dear participants, we've enjoyed having you with us. I saw, I went through the panel, through the list of participants. I see many people uh, back as, by popular demand, many people return over and over. So we're glad and hope that you benefited from this. Thank you for turning into this final webinar uh, today and for participating and contributing very much. As always, we will send up a follow. We will send a follow-up mail with post webinar materials and a link as well to the I4CP research that I mentioned for you, the survey for you to take part of if you would like to. Thank you very much to our partners, Mercer and Alibaba. To our speakers, Michelle Ting, Professor uh, Ting, thank you, Joost Hultman and Xin Fan from Alibaba. Participants, contributors, thanks so much. We wish you a festive wishes for the rest of the year. Look forward to seeing you in one of our programs or webinars next year. Thanks so much.